Well, he's worthy. Whether everything seems to be going the way we want it to or complete opposite, his goodness does not change. I'm glad for that. We're singing about heaven tonight. I think every congregational song we sang was about heaven. And I got to thinking about probably 24, 25 years ago, And I don't think I'd even met Stormy yet. I remember the Lutrick family. Now, this is before y'all came along into the picture. Uh, they used to travel in motor homes and buses, and they bought the cheapest ones they could find, so they always broke down. And, and Brother Gary was the master of managing to break down within a couple miles of an independent Baptist church. He, was just, he, just, he had that figured out somehow, but I remember one Sunday morning they broke down on I-30 in Benton, Arkansas, right down the road from our church. And so he called our pastor, Brother Ken Graham, and Brother Graham sent some men with a church van, and they went and picked up the Lutri. Kids were just little at that time, and at least the girls were. And uh, they came to church that day. I remember that night, Brother Graham said, well, we got the Lutrix here. We're going to use them. And so they got up and sang, and I don't remember what all they sang, but after a few minutes, Miss Stephanie Lutrick started singing in that Yankee, Michigan accent. But she started singing, You've been my life for so long. You were right when I was wrong. Can't repay all the love you've given me. And I remember I just started weeping. And I'm not really a very emotional person. And I'm sure not much of a crier. But I'm just sitting there weeping while they're singing, Lord, you're the best thing ever happened to me. It got so bad, I started snotting too. And it's really bad when you go to snot, and I mean, it's running all over my face. I'm just sitting there wiping tears, snot. It's all mixed together at that point. And, uh, and, and Brother Graham walks up and says, let's take up an offering for the Lutri. They've been a blessing to us tonight, and they're going to need some repairs done on their bus. So let's take it. Let me get some ushers to come ahead. And, and Daniel, you come help. I'm, I've been at this church two years. You ain't ever called on me to take up an offering. And now that my face is a mess covered in all this junk, you call on me to come be an usher. But uh, Back in September, we was in a meeting in Arkansas, and I was getting ready to leave, and Miss Stephanie just stopped me. I was walking across the parking lot. She said, hey, I hear you got a boy that's out in the weeds. She said, we've been there. And she said, I'm praying for him, and I'm praying for you and your family. And I appreciate that. I, I really do, and my prayers go out to the Lutrick family tonight. Uh, but let's go to Isaiah chapter 45 in our Bibles. I know the time. I, I know... It's been a long weekend, and I'll be mindful of that, but Isaiah 45. There's a ditch on both sides of the road. Y'all know that? And that's not my message, what I'm going to say, but uh, in the Christian life, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. And we, we hear a lot about being real, and when we should be real. Now, the bad ditch of that is when... In mo a lot of modern Christianity, progressive Christianity, their idea of real is, well, nobody's perfect, and I like my drinking, and I like my cussing, and you know, but I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, it doesn't matter. That's some, you know, they'll put a t-shirt on, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. You know, they just make light of sin. And that's a ditch. And that's, that's not what we mean when we say we want to be real. Now, the, the other ditch is... A lot of times in fundamentalism, it's we put on this mask like we never have a bad day or a bad moment. Yeah. Everything, our children are perfect, our marriage is perfect, our Christian walk is perfect. And you know what we do when we do that? We just discourage others who are actually trying to live a real Christian life. And they're thinking, I could never be what they are. They're not what they portray to be. They're just a better actor than you. I think our desire, it should be, and I think it's been portrayed in the testimonies we've heard here tonight. We want to strive to please God. Yes, sir. I, I want to strive for, 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 I can't even say it. It's how imperfect I am. I want to strive for perfection. You can tell I'm far from it. But I don't want to put on a mask and act like I've actually attained it. Because none of us have. And so your realness can be a help to somebody else. 
And so we do want to be real. I'm not into fake Christianity. I'm not into carnal Christianity. I mean, that's an oxymoron, but I'm not into that, but I don't, I'm not into fake Christianity either. And so I appreciate, appreciate y'all being real. I feel at home here, and I guess we've been coming around just a couple years now, but I feel at home, and I appreciate that. Isaiah 45, verse number 1, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness, and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. We'll leave off reading right there tonight, and you can be seated. I'm interested in one phrase in verse number 3. He said, I will give thee the treasures of darkness. I'd like to preach on that thought for a few minutes tonight. The treasures of darkness. And I'll be honest with you, that, that phrase just seems weird to me because when I think of darkness, I don't think of positive things. I, I don't think of treasure. That's not where my mind goes necessarily when I think of darkness. Um, to me, darkness is very intimidating. It can be very frightening. Uh, no, nobody's worried about the monster in the closet or the boogeyman hiding under the bed during the daylight or when the lights are on. Nobody gives any thought of that, but you, you let it get dark outside and then the lights go off in the room. All of a sudden, every little bump you hear, every little sound, every creak, I mean, every shadow, you know something's coming to get you. There's just something about the darkness. And, and, and for me, I mean, a lot of people, you know, had nightmares when they were kids. I didn't have that problem when I was a kid. I waited till I got grown. And, and I don't just have nightmares, I have night terrors. I wake up from the nightmare, but it's still just as real going on in the moment, even though I, I'm awake. And it drives my wife crazy because she has to put up with this. I mean, even, even recently, I mean, there's been many times I'll wake up in, in my mind, somebody's walking toward me with a knife, or there's a snake slithering up the bed, and, and, and when they get ready to stab or the snake gets ready to bite, I'm awake. I'm moving, but it's still so very real, and I'm jumping in across my wife into the floor, hollering, and she's got to turn the light on and get my attention, and it's embarrassing, y'all. I remember a few years ago, we was out in Colorado, and they had me and a bunch of other preachers staying in a cabin on top of a mountain, and you know out in Colorado, it's dry. I woke up in the middle of the night. I woke up, and, and my tongue was stuck to the roof of my mouth. I didn't quite know what was going on. I just jumped up, started running around the room going, my tongue is on my mouth, my tongue. And Stormy's like, just get your tongue unstuck. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing she has to put up with. And so y'all pray for her. Make that a serious matter of prayer. <laughs> There's something about the darkness, and yet she stole my thunder this morning in the question and answer because she said this, but it's the truth. Darkness is not a thing. It's the absence of a thing. It's the absence of light. And since it's really not a thing, it has no power in and of itself. I'm going to tell you something, church. For something that has no power, it sure can seem overwhelming. Probably 20 years ago, me and Jesse Craigle were doing a meeting in East Tennessee. We drove over to Gatlinburg one day and we was just walking down the little strip there and we came past Ripley's Haunted Adventure. I said, hey, you want to go in? He said, sure. Not, probably not the brightest idea. Probably wouldn't do that now. Uh, but we paid the money and we go through this haunted house. And what they do, there they line you up in a group of about six or seven people and you have to put your hand on the person's shoulder in front of you and somebody's leading and, and, and you walk through this dark haunted house. Well, that's how Jesse goes through life anyway, you know, just with his hand on somebody's shoulder. So he's behind me and here we go through this haunted house. And, uh, you know, really the most frightening thing about the whole seven or eight minutes was just the darkness. There was nothing in there that was going to hurt us or harm us. But I remember at one time, I mean, there was just a lot of noise and, and a lot of chaos and our group took off running and Jesse's running behind me. He said, what are we running from? I'm like, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. 
I remember seeing the, the light for that exit. I was never so glad to get out of a building in all my life than to get out of that haunted house. I said, never again. There was nothing in there that was going to hurt us. The, the most frightening thing about the whole situation was the darkness. But sometimes what isn't there seems just as painful as what is. And life will take you through some dark places. Some dark valleys, some dark storms. But he says he's got treasures there. Now before we get too far into this, back up to verse 1. Just for some context, it said, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. Now, there's no evidence in the Bible that would indicate that Cyrus was a godly man or a worshiper of the true God. And, and yet, he is called his anointed. See, what happens here is God anointed Cyrus to perform a very important task to accomplish God's purpose. The title anointed doesn't mean that Cyrus was holy in his character, but he was appointed to an office to accomplish God's task. And by the way, God still works that way. God raises up leaders. He takes down leaders. He'll raise up some leaders to be a blessing to a nation, and he'll raise up some leaders to bring judgment to a nation. I'll let you take a guess at where we're at right now in that situation. But Cyrus's great longing was to enter into the city of Babylon. Babylon was the largest city in the world at that time in history, and it had great wealth and great treasure, and Cyrus wanted access to the treasure. But when he surveyed the entrance to the city, he found it was firmly secure with gates of brass and bars of iron. If you've ever read treasure hunting books or watch some of the treasure hunting movies. Have you ever noticed the treasure is never just laying out in the open or in a, in a lighted place? Never. So what kind of story are you going to have with that? We heard about a treasure. We looked. There it was. The end. <laughs> Roll credits. Now treasure is always hidden in a dark place. It's kept in a secure place. And oftentimes a scary place. Let me give you three thoughts and I'm done. Number one, I want you to notice the plan of God. They sang a while ago, the Howertons, about Him having a plan. Verse number two, the Lord says, I will go before thee. Now that speaks of a preliminary work of God. He tells Cyrus, I I'm going to go before you. There, there must be great difficulties and, and darkness if God says He needs to go before us. But he says, I I'm going to go before you. I I'm going to do some work that you can't do yourself. And brother and sister, we'll go through some dark places and go through some things that we can't handle it all by ourselves. I know you think you're Superman. I know you think you're super Christian. But the reality is, none of us here tonight can handle all the things that are waiting out ahead of us. So I'm glad we got a God that says, hey, I'll go before you and I'll take care of these things that I know you can't handle by yourself. It was God who opened the gates of Babylon for Cyrus. And the interesting thing is, it's God that puts it in writing 150 years before it actually happened. What we're reading about here tonight in Isaiah 45, it doesn't take place for another 150 years. Do you realize, child of God, that there are things in your life that God started setting in motion and working on long before your mom and daddy even thought about you? And he's taking care of things that we cannot handle by ourselves. He says, verse 3, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I don't know if y'all know this, but life has some crooked paths. Maybe not in the state of Kansas, but you, you, you get in the mountains and the country, man, there's some crooked places. And, and even life has crooked places and paths. And God doesn't say when, where, or how He'll straighten out the path. He just says that He will. We just have to wait patiently for its fulfillment, which is easier said than done. If you get out ahead of God, if I get out ahead of God, we just make a mess of things. You say, why are the paths crooked? Well, some are crooked because it's just their very nature to be so. It just is what it is. 
Some paths are crooked because of our own iniquities. According to Isaiah 59, it tells us that paths are crooked sometimes because of our sin and iniquity. When I'm not in fellowship with God, when I'm not walking with God like I should, when my sin has become that, well, nobody's perfect, so I even try. When that becomes our attitude, paths get crooked of our own making. But then other paths are made crooked by the hand of God because He knows what we need. Even as people of God, we face afflictions, trials, tragedies, heartaches, cancer, death of loved ones. We face those things. But he knows what we need. I don't know what I need. If I had my way, if I had my way, Miss Stephanie Lutrick and so many others would have been healed and they'd still be here. But that's my way. But God knows what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. If I had my way, no parent would ever have to walk a child, watch a child walk off into the world. But God's got a plan and God knows what he's doing. How how does he straighten the paths? He said he would. He said he'd make the crooked places straight. Well, sometimes he just removes them. We have heard the testimonies where somebody you know, went to the doctor and the doctor said, it's cancer, it's so far gone, there's nothing we can do. I'm sorry, we can't do anything. God's people go to praying. They go back to the doctor and the doctor scratches his head and says, I don't know what to tell you, but it's gone. I don't know how it happened. I don't know where it went, but it's not there. You are healed. We know what happened. Better than that, we know who happened. But that's not always the case, is it? He's more than able to do that. But sometimes he straightens the paths by just reconciling our minds to them. I think about Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 when he talked about that thorn in the flesh. Three times he asked God to take it away and God wouldn't do it. God said, Paul, I'm I'm not taking away that problem, that pain. But my grace is sufficient. He may not take your thorn away. He may not take the cancer away. But His grace is sufficient. And if you can get a hold of that tonight, it'll help you as you travel along them crooked paths that you think there's no way, you'll find His grace is sufficient. Even Jesus prayed in the garden before He went to Calvary, Father, if it be Thy will, let this cup pass from Me. Three times, just like Paul prayed, three times Jesus prayed. He said, nevertheless, not My will, but Thine be done. You say, what was that? Jesus saw what was in that cup. He he was horrified at the thought of taking what was in that cup. And yet He reconciled His mind to it when He said, not My will, but Thy will be done. So we see a preliminary work of God involved in His plan. But then we see the power of God. Keep reading verse number 2. He said, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. Do you realize the things that we look at that looks like obstacles and opposition that looks impossible to us? It ain't a big deal to God. Amen. Those gates of brass speak of opposition from without. And we have opposition. The world, the flesh, the devil, we have very real enemies. We have very real opposition. But it's no problem for our God. I believe the bars of iron which were to strengthen the gates, I believe that speaks of opposition from within. That's where them insecurities come in. We don't just have enemies out there. We got enemies within us. Doubt, fears, deception, guilt. Those kind of things will haunt you. Those kind of things, if you let them, they'll keep you from living a victorious Christian life. 
And I'm talking about very real things that we all deal with at some point in the Christian life. But the Lord says, I will break. I will cut and sunder. I can't do it myself. Brother and sister, you can't do it yourself. But you got a great big God that sits on the throne tonight. And the things that look impossible to us, they ain't a problem for Him. Hallelujah. You better learn to look to Him and rely on Him. Because He can handle what you cannot. So we see the plan of God. Number two, we see the promise of God. Verse number three, he said, And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. And let me say this, that, that expression there, the treasures of darkness, that doesn't mean that the treasures themselves are darkness. Do you understand that? Matter of fact, Paul told us in Ephesians 5 verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. As the people of God, we're people of light. God brought us out of darkness into the light. So we have no business getting tangled up with the dark things of this world. Oh, do I dare say? Halloween's out, (laughs) y'all. That always goes over well. Halloween and Santa Claus. You hit that, man. You lose everybody. <laughs> hey, man, every, I, I, I get, every year every year in October, I see it. I, I see on Facebook yeah, all, the, all the Christians trying to justify Halloween. Nah. Well, we don't want to deprive the kids of candy. Go November 1st to Walmart. It'll be half off or even more than that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm not even a fan of trunk or treat. Y'all may do it here. I don't know. Most of the churches I go to have trunk or treat, so I'm certainly not breaking fellowship with anybody. I, I, don't, I don't want to be associated with darkness. I don't want anything to do with it. You do what works for you, amen. I don't, want to, I don't want anything to do with it. God brought me out of that. God saved me from that, amen. And I know if you do celebrate it, I know you're not glorifying the devil. I get that. You, you, and I understand, but I just... I just want to be a Christian. Well, what this expression means, did I lose y'all right there? Did we just, did we sink the ship? I hope not. We was having a good, good meeting all weekend. Then Brother Daniel hit on Halloween. (laughs) What it means, the treasures of darkness, it means they were hidden in darkness until they were brought to the light. Now, you know what? Everybody wants to be in the light. Everybody has a natural desire to want to be in the light. And, and sadly, social media has made it where everybody's got a platform, everybody's got a voice, and they can put all their little thoughts out into the world, into the land of social media, and everybody's getting their moment, their, their little bit of fame. And a lot of you, the worst thing ever happened to you was social media. Some of you, we thought you were pretty intelligent people until you got on Facebook, and then it was like, oh, whoa. Um, but, but it has is, it is made it where everybody's got a voice. And, and even we see all the selfies. I hate selfies. Quit it, y'all. Amen. I don't, I don't get it. Just a picture of you. Is there, is there any more form of pride than just a picture of you? I'm not talking about like Brother Khan snapping a selfie with me yesterday. That was me and Brother Khan. Are you and your wife out on a date? What are you and your family? I'm not talking about that. I, I mean, even you and your deer you shot. I mean, I'm, I don't have a problem with that. I'm just talking about just you. You woke up one morning and thought, man, I am looking hot today. Woo. I better snap a picture of this and post it on social media so everybody can see how good I'm looking today. Huh? And if you're married, I mean, what are you hunting for? I mean, I think it's weird that teenagers do it, but you're married. You make me nervous. You need to stop it, amen. <laughs> Don't tempt me, because <laughs> I could. It's the last service. I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm really trying to be encouraging. How am I doing? <laughs> mm. Everybody wants to be in the light. But do you know God does a lot of His best work in the dark? 
See, when God gets ready to prepare you for the light, He'll put you in the dark. We see that all through the Bible. Joseph. You could come to the end of the book of Genesis and you see Joseph, you know, on the throne. I mean, Lord over Egypt. He's got it all. You think, man, I want to be like Joseph. Well, don't forget the pit. Don't forget the lies of Potiphar's wife, the false accusations. Don't forget all them years in that dirty, dark prison that led to him in that position of authority on the throne. Even Moses spent 40 years on the backside of a desert before God got, got him to a place where he could use him. Everybody thinks about Moses standing at the Red Sea, and we've all seen the old movie. I mean, Charlton Heston playing Moses there. I mean, raises that rod the sea parts. We're like, man, I want to be like Moses. You want to go through some darkness? Because he did. Matter of fact, Moses knew about darkness when he said, Lord, show me thy glory. He said, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to put you in a dark place. But hey, Moses, it's in this dark place. You're going to see my glory like you've never seen it before. Job knew about darkness. Paul knew about darkness. I mean, the first three days of Paul's saved life, he was blind and in darkness without sight, and yet he went on to give us the majority of the New Testament of our Bible. How, how often do we say this and hear this? I just want to be like Jesus. Well, amen, I hope so. But he knew about darkness probably more than anybody else. Amen. The light of the world had to go through the greatest darkness so that we could be brought from darkness into light. I mean, even His conception, Jesus went through the darkness of a womb. He went through the darkness of facing temptation. He went through the darkness of the suffering of Calvary. He went through the darkness of, tomb, of a tomb. He went through the darkness of hell itself. But thank God three days later, that light came shining forth. And they will never, ever, ever put that light out again. Hallelujah. And he went through all that so you and I wouldn't have to spend eternity in darkness. Bless his name. I think about my generation. We know about the old camera film. I'm one of them people. I was born in the 1900s. You know, tell how, how, how this new generation, oh, he's from the 1900s. <laughs> I remember before we had the smartphones and, and the cameras right there on our phone, and, and we had that, you know, we had the, you know, disposable Kodak cameras. We'd get them, we'd, we'd take them to camp and snap pictures, you know, and all that. And you had to take them to Walmart to get it developed. You had to wait a week or two. And you would wait with such anticipation to get your pictures back. And finally they'd come back and half of them were blurry or smudged or the heads were cut off. But it had to be developed. I remember, when, I remember hearing, hearing about one hour photo. I'm like, no, nah, ain't no way, man. They can't make pictures in one hour. Now we have them instantly. Though, though the old camera film was developed in the dark. Now you showed the pictures in the light. The ones that actually turned out okay. But it was developed in the dark. I think about a woman who carries a child. That They carry that child for nine months. God places that child in the darkness of a womb for nine months. And He's careful not to bring it into the light too soon. Because if the baby comes too soon, there can be problems and complications. And there's a lot of people that have a desire to serve God and be in the ministry, and God's got them in the darkness, and they're ready to burst out into the light, and the Lord's saying, not yet. Not just yet. But we get antsy, and we've got that zeal, and we're ready to go. I want to serve God. I want to, I want to do something for God. But, but, but too often, I think every young preacher uh, can relate to this, and I remember this in my own life, too often that zeal was more, I want to get out here and make a name for myself. In the name of doing something for God, I want to make a name for myself. And so God says, not yet. You're not ready. And I've seen a lot of young men go and take churches, and they said, I'm ready to pastor. And the first church that calls them, they're like, yeah, here I come. And their pastor says, I don't think you're ready, and I don't think that's the right church for you. Oh, no, preacher, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go turn it upside down. And they don't listen to the pastor when he says, yeah, but here's what you don't know. In the last five years, they've ran off ten pastors. And you ain't going to be the one to get it straightened out. you got to wait 
for God's timing. It'll just be a mess. Helen Keller, she was blind the majority of her life. She said this, the only thing worse than being blind would be having sight, but no vision. She made a distinction there between eyesight and insight. And there is a difference. I think some of our greatest insight comes in those dark places where all we can do is just have faith in God. So we see the promise of God, but then lastly, we see the purpose of God. God does all things for a purpose. Verse number 3. Middle of the verse, he said, That thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Verse 6. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. You say, preacher, why why does God allow, allow us to go through darkness and trials and temptations? Why do we face those things? He does it to make himself known. Even when we were lost, trials and temptations are meant to bring us into a personal relationship with the Lord. Now, unless you were just really young when you got saved, probably any of us that were, if you're like me, I was 19 or even some later in life, usually God will use a dark place to get our attention for us to realize I am lost and I need the Lord. He'll use those low places, those dark places, to get our attention drawn to Him. But even after we're saved, He he uses the dark places so that we can know His power in an even greater way. If you're saved, you've experienced the power of God. But He wants to show you even more power after you get saved. There's so many examples of that in the Bible, but I think one of my, my favorite is the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus got sick. He was dead. Now keep in mind, in John 12... In John 12, Jesus is in the house of Mary and Martha, and they're sitting at the table, and it said Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with them. And you say, what's the big deal about that? He was dead in the previous chapter. So it's a pretty big deal. (laughs) And uh, he gets sick in chapter number 11. And the disciples say, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. Are we going to go? No. Jesus, Lazarus is dead. Are we going to go? Not yet. Four days after Lazarus is dead, they finally show up. And here comes Martha, just like we preached this morning, in his face. Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Here comes Mary. She gets at his feet. Now, she says basically the same thing, but with a different attitude. Lord, if you'd have been here, our brother wouldn't have died. God could have showed up And healed Lazarus. He did that all through his earthly ministry. It would have been nothing. But you know what? They had seen that. They had seen blinded eyes open. They had seen the lame get up and walk. They had seen the lepers cleanse. They, They had seen those things. You know what the Lord was saying? I'm getting ready to show my power in a way you ain't seen it before. And by the way, it was that power and that miracle that really got the religious crowd stirred up to the place they said, we got to stop him. And that was his whole goal in the first place. He's headed toward Calvary. That's why he came, to go to a cross and suffer and bleed and die and make a way to God. And he walked up to that tomb and said, Lazarus! Come forth. The Bible says, He that came forth, came forth bound hand and foot, and he said, Loose him and let him go. They'd never seen that one before. They hadn't seen God's, the Lord's power on that fashion. So maybe God's got you in a dark place tonight, but He's getting ready to show you His power in a way you've never seen it before. God puts us in dark places to give Him more praise. I mean, I'll tell you who praises God the most. It's the one that went through the darkness and they saw God's blessings and they saw God's power and they experienced God's grace and they came out when the plan had been followed, when the promise had been fulfilled, when the purpose had been found out. They came out with a louder and deeper praise than when they went in. And that ought to be any of us. We've seen God's power in His plan. 
We ought to come out with our hands in the air saying, glory be to God. Amen. So tonight, there, there's a difference between burying something and planting something. It looks the same. You're putting something in the ground and covering it with dirt. But when you bury something, you're, you're putting it there, you're covering it up so it'll stay there. You don't anticipate it coming up. You go to the cemetery, they put a body in the ground. You, you really want the body to stay in the ground, don't you? At least until the resurrection. Amen. But when you plant something, you're covering it up so it'll change, so it'll grow, so it'll develop. Maybe tonight you've come into church and you feel like you've been buried. And you don't even realize God's just planted you because He wants to grow you and develop you. Maybe change you a little bit. I love the verse, Psalm 30, verse number 5. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Life will take you through some dark places, church. While you're there, won't you just look for those treasures that He has for you? Instead of complaining and griping and fussing, and if you, by the way, if that's how you're handling it, I'm not even criticizing you tonight. Because there's people that are going through things I've never experienced, and I don't understand. So if that's how you're handling it, I'm not even being hard on you. But I am saying based on what we know from the Word of God, while you're there, why don't you look for the treasures He has for you? Because He says He's got them in the darkness. Let's all stand. If you're able. I, I mean it when I say my, my heart tonight is just to encourage you. I know I was a little hard on you there for a few minutes, but I'm really trying to encourage somebody because there are a lot of saved, spirit-filled servants of God who are going through some hard places, some hard, dark places. Don't miss the blessings that are there. The treasures God has for you. Don't miss it. And when you come out, just come out praising Him. Like hopefully you've already been doing when it was dark. You got a song, Brother Ben? Go ahead, brother. As Brother Ben sings, if you need to come pray, find you a place at the altar and do business with God. was broken for me. It may require suffering, but Lord, I am willing. Are you willing tonight? I have found that to be the truth.
the privilege to hear I have brought you through this valley just to show careful not to <clears throat> grade your darkness or your trial according to somebody else's. God's trying to get you somewhere. <clears throat> He's got a perfect, righteous, holy plan. And that involves you taking hold of Him and letting Him take hold of you and getting you to that next step. There's some parents right now begging God to save their two-year-old baby. I'm not going through that, but I can sure beg God. I can, I can stand up next to them, put on the armor, and fight with them in prayer. There's several, several folks mourning deaths of loved ones just in the last few days. <clears throat> Stephanie Lustrick passed. The same day she passed, Dr. Dwayne Only, who preached here back in 2002 or three, something like that. Um, he passed away. <clears throat> Gary Lutrick Jr. sent me this text. I texted them and texting all of them but um, he sent me this text he says thank you preacher she lived well she died right she showed us all how to leave this world as a godly Christian just Tuesday she had a group of nurses surrounding her and she was witnessing to them about the grace of God in her life saying this morning, I believe it was this morning, might have been tonight, everybody will be happy over there. She's happy. She's happy. Family's going to hurt and they're going to mourn and be sad, but she's happy. Amen. 
don't compare your situation with someone else's. Please be careful of that. I mean, here, here's the truth. <clears throat> Asaph was looking for something this afternoon. Honestly, I forget what it was. Um, but he was crying heartbroken, like crying, like not, not whining, not... I wouldn't have paid attention to him if he's just being whiny. Um, but, he, I mean, he was crying. And uh, the, his, his hurt isn't isn't so much different than the Lutrick family. I mean, he's going through what he's going through. You're going through what you're going through. Don't make light of your own situation. Don't, like, but don't make light of what God is trying to do in you. Don't do that. You grab hold of him. Let him grab hold of you. And you pray for this family that's begging God to save their two-year-old. You pray for this Lutrick family. You pray for the waters as they uh, drive down the road from state to state all over creation. You pray for those folks in your life that you know and love that are uh, whatever's coming. I mean, goodness, we all have loved ones that are in some struggles. <clears throat> Did you sing that chorus one more time? He's going to sing this chorus. I just want you to listen. Let God speak to you. Appreciate that message. There will come sweet things out of dark places. Heavenly light where was dim his touch will be sweeter and my love will be deeper out of dark lonely places Amen. come sweet things from him all God's people said Amen. Father, we love you. Thank you for a good day in your house. Thank you, Lord, for a good weekend. I do pray that you continue to, to speak, and Lord, that we would listen, that you'd help us to do that. Lord, we didn't just show up here today to fill a square or pass some time. We came to meet with you, and I know that you're not done with some work in my life and my mind and my thought process and, and all that, so help me to be attentive to what you're trying to say. Help us all, Lord, to to listen, to hear, to heed, uh, God, that we can serve you better in the days ahead. We love you. We do pray for the Lutrick family, God. We pray for uh, this little girl, that, God, you'd touch her. We pray, Lord, for um, just our families, the things we're going through. Lord, I pray that you just do a mighty work. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.